Let's go ahead and start on our next one, our, our next uh, set of presentations. And the first uh, speaker is going to be Anna Legrand. And she's from the University of Connecticut and talking about identification of insectary plants for conservation biocontrol. And this is a Northeastern IPM Center partnership grant project. So Anna, go ahead and get started. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. I want to share today uh, with you some information about a couple projects that we're doing with conservation biological control. Can I have the next slide, please? And this work really started with uh, white grub management, actually. Um, we had questions about uh, understanding better uh, what natural enemies are out there that could help us with uh, uh, increasing mortality among white grubs. And, um, we did some work with um, what we call tifia parasitoids, of which we have two species in our area. We have the spring tifia and we have the summer tifia. And you can actually see them in action there on the slide. In each corner, you see in a couple of white grubs that have these um, white structures attached to them. And they're actually not abnormalities of the grub, but they are larval parasitoids um, that are feeding from the grub and eventually will only leave the head capsule behind. So we did a project uh, to find out what type of insectary plants we could use to attract these parasitoids uh, to increase the presence and to increase the survival. Um, we did several tests of ornamental plants and some hair plants. And what we found uh, through this project was that at least for the spring tifia, which is a tifia parasitoid that occurs um, in May to early June. Uh, we found out that peonies were the best plant uh, that we could select based on the high numbers of tifia that it attracted and also the lack of susceptibility to Japanese beetle uh, feeding injuries. So that was um, one of the choices we um, determined was uh, the best one for the spring tifia. Now for the summer tifia, we did um, similar testing and out of many plants we tested either ornamentals or herbs, we could really only find uh, wild carrot to be the best plant that attracts uh, this particular uh, summer tifia that occurs uh, late in the summer. And you can actually see um, the little summer tifia flying towards the wild carrot flower there in the picture of the slide at the bottom. Now, um, the story with the summer tifia is not over, as you will hear me uh, mention in a moment. And by the way, uh, you can also see on top of the slide, uh, the peony flower uh, before it opens, that's the time when um, you see uh, the spring tifia come to it and uh, they're feeding on the extra floral nectar that the plant provides. Along with tifia, you find many other beneficial insects that um, come to it. And so it's a very exciting time to, to see these insects on, on, those, uh, on those plants. I should mention also that the, the spring tifia is an important uh, mortality factor, uh, we have documented a range of uh, 53 to 61 percent uh, parasitism on the Japanese beetle grubs, but they also attack uh, oriental beetle grubs as well. Next slide, please. So with the results from TIFIA, it, it become apparent uh, to us that it's very important to understand the specific interactions between um, a flower and the natural enemies you try to attract. For the summer tifia, we saw that uh, they were very particular about the type of plant uh, they were attracted to. So we um, wanted to understand better about these interactions. And in 2015, uh, we started a project looking at other insectary plants you could use for attracting natural enemies. And we did an evaluation of a number of cut flowers uh, for this purpose. And in the field, we had small plots of um, several uh, cut flowers and we took aspirator samples from them and also back flower samples and uh, we found that um, there's a great diversity of insects uh, coming to these plants. The hope is that we're going to use this information to um, look at plants that can be useful for conservation biocontrol purposes um, in terms of attracting natural enemies uh, for the cabbage caterpillar, caterpillar complex. So next slide, please. And to make a, a long story short, we are still working through the results uh, from the 2015 survey, but what you can see in the slide there are summaries of um, 
the different uh, groups uh, that we found uh, for each uh, type of plant that we tested. And these are summarized by nat uh, natural enemy families. And also we collected information on pollinator families. And really we see each plant attracting a number of, of groups. Uh, it's very exciting to see a great diversity of um, mostly parasitoids, but also uh, insect predators. And one of the plants, Amimahus, which is there to your right of the slide, really was um, a big um, standout in terms of um, attracting a great number of families, 16 uh, in total for natural enemies. Next slide, please. And you can see some examples of those families listed here. Um, it's really a great diversity. And you can also see the AMI plant uh, in the picture. And we um, are excited to follow up on this. And we're still going through all the data, looking at different species that are making up um, the groups that we collected. Now, you should note on top of the list, I have tifids there listed. And that group includes the uh, summer tifia uh, parasitoid that I mentioned earlier. So we were happy to find it uh, coming to these plants and this army um, could be a nice substitute for the wild carrot that uh, we have found out earlier was our only choice at, at the moment to attract summer tifia. Next slide, please. And I just wanna thank a number of persons involved with the project and funding uh, from different sources, including the Northeast IPM Center Partnership Grant. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Anna. Very interesting. Um, we're going to move on now to our next presentation by uh, Kirby Stafford. He's at the University of Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, I'm going to talk about overwintering survival of the black-legged tick. And this is a project funded through the Northeastern IPM Center. So Kirby, go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as everyone knows, Lyme disease uh, and a number of other tick-borne diseases continue to increase in the United States, and uh, the CDC ex estimates there's well over 300,000 cases of Lyme disease every year. And management uh, approaches have included things like personal protection measures, chemical control, either with synthetic insecticides or botanicals uh, or natural uh, biological compounds like uh, entomopathogenic fungi host reduction or exclusion, host targeted acaricides, um, and even some host targeted vaccines uh, that are now being evaluated. But another component is landscape or vegetative management. And most ticks require high humidity uh, for and cover for uh, survival. Next slide. So uh, just kind of bringing up, uh, there was an interesting paper uh, titled, What Do We Need to Know About Lyme Disease Ecology to Prevent Lyme Disease in the Northeastern United States? And some of the things that came out of that was, uh, you know, determining um, the, uh, how landscape structure influences uh, the effectiveness of different tick control strategies and identifying landscape markers that might uh, uh, suggest improved success of specific interventions, uh, as well as how humans uh, are using different microhabitats that could elevate the risk. And one of the studies that we've done here, and I'll get to the project here in a moment, is that uh, here studies here in Connecticut uh, we found that, uh, you know, for example, invasive uh, Japanese barberry provided a very ideal microhabitat for the tick and rodent host. And when barberry was reduced from 62% of cover to 3% of cover, um, it reduced the density of infected adult black-legged ticks to 60% of that of unmanaged, you know, infestations. Next slide. And as we look back at some of our uh, tick data over the years, we found a association between greater summer nymphal uh, ice scapularis population sizes and higher winter, that is mainly January precipitation. And another part of our hypothesis that greater January snowfall will increase tick overwintering survival rates is supported by uh, studies that have found that snow reduces energy loss and keeps soil temperatures much higher than air temperatures in the winter. So that kind of leads into this project. It supports the idea that cold, dry winters may reduce overwintering survival. And this, this is very important in terms of not only modeling the distribution and spread of the tick and survival of the tick, but also implementation of future IPM strategies. So therefore, winter conditions during the coldest months of the year may serve as a bottleneck to tick populations and, um, and the densities that you find the next year. 
Next slide. So with funding under an IPM partnership grant in cooperation with the Maine Medical Research, uh, Research Institute, uh, Charles Labelzik uh, up there, we began a study in Connecticut and Maine uh, looking at the overwintering survival uh, of Exodes scapularis. And the ticks are, nymphal ticks are placed in tubes within uh, buried tick pots over the winter with hobo data, data loggers and a complete randomized block design with two factors. We're looking at the combinations of snow removal and leaf litter removal uh, to examine habitat characteristics on survival and their role in landscape management practices. And we're going to, re we did the study this past winter. We're gonna repeat the study this winter. And uh, in addition, uh, we're gonna add adult Lone Star ticks to the project for the winter of 2016, 2017, because Lone Star ticks have been moving north. They're abundant on the Eastern end of Long Island. They're now becoming established on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And we're starting to see more of them here in Connecticut, although they're not really established yet. Next slide. So this just kind of highlights the results of the overwinter survival study this past winter uh, for Connecticut. Uh, you will see in the site uh, plots where we had uh, no leaf litter removal and snow, no snow removal, overwintering survival was 94%. At the plots where we removed the leaves and did not remove the snow, or we did not remove the leaves and we removed the snow, survival was very comparable, 85 and 86%. But at the sites where we remove both leaf litter cover and the snow, uh, thereby exposing the ticks to more harsh winter conditions, uh, survival was only 77%. And in the past, interestingly, we found that just removing leaf litter from the perimeter of our property could reduce the number of ticks on the lawn by 49 to 70%. And this kind of, kind of goes along with that. So this study will provide some interesting hard data uh, for use by modelers as they look at uh, the expansion uh, of the black-legged tick northward, uh, as well as the Lone Star tick as it continues to move north, and provide some additional information on landscape management practices to be incorporated into a tick IPM program. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Kirby. Very interesting. And to note, Kirby also spoke at our, at our Northeastern IPM Center AC meeting where we had a special session. So um, there's some more information on our website uh, for those who were, who were interested. We're now going to go to uh, John Jameson uh, from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And he's going to tell us a bit about his project on why forage rovers have turned to no-till production. And this is a Northeastern IPM Center funded project. So John, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, we wanted to look at both a qualitative and a quantitative approach to looking at how um, mo moving to no-till can, can affect production. And our first, if I could have the next, uh, next slide, please. You know, certainly no-till is not a new practice um, to production in, in the United States. We've been doing this since I was in graduate school. And that was a long time ago. But what, one of the things we've really shown is that uh, leaving the residue on the surface has really helped protect the soil uh, from erosion losses. And we are seeing considerably greater intensity of rainfall and frequency of rainfall in the Northeast. And if we're going to do a decent job at protecting our soils um, moving forward, I think it's going to be increasingly important to try to adopt no-till production. Um, the the other thing that we wanted, so what we really wanted to know was, we've had, just had a handful of growers in Maine and New Hampshire um, adopt this, and they've kind of done it principally on their own, which was kind of interesting. And um, we wanted to find out why they wanted to do it what's been working well and what's not working particularly well. So we had intensive interviews, um, about an hour and a half to sometimes two hours with 20 different farmers in Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, we taped those interviews, we transcribed them and put them into this um, software package called InVivo. And um, some of the products that come out of the, the, the analysis are word clouds. And so what I'd like to do is talk to you about a couple of the word clouds that we generated on what 
growers found that was positive about moving to no-till and what were some of the problems. So if we could have the next slide. Um, for those of you that maybe this is new to, the larger the word, the more often different growers um, express this in the, in the conversation. And the first thing you'll notice between images is that um, uh, there are fewer words in what's working well for growers. So what seems to be working well for growers seems to be working fairly well across the, the group that we worked with. And the first thing you'll see is that fuel and time are the two biggest things that, that growers really talked about that were really improving things. So they're saving fuel, they're saving time, and, uh, and this really works well for them. We, in some other work that my colleagues did, they were finding that growers were finding about uh, $50 an acre in savings on that. Um, the other interesting things that we found on there, um, some growers are, were finding nitrogen benefits with moving to no-till and using cover crops. So that's exciting and we're gonna start um, exploring this further, actually starting tomorrow with some um, grow study circles that we're, we're planning with our growers this year to try to tease this out. Um, but it's really, it will be a huge benefit if we can actually find that using cover crops and moving to no-till can actually save in nitrogen, that will be a positive benefit. If we can go to the next slide, please. When we look at the, what's not working well for our growers, um, you'll see that first of all, there are a lot more words here. So, so there's not just one thing that's over, overriding the, the issue here. Worms is probably the biggest word, and growers are concerned that the leaving the residue on the surface is is creating habitat for them, and um, uh, and so one of the things that really comes out of this is that growers need to scout. Uh, many growers are using uh, traded corn lines to help prevent this, but not all traded corn lines are, are effective on all the different kinds of worms, army worms, black cut worms, etc. So they need to be aware of that. Planting was another big word or corn planting was another large word. Sometimes growers are trying to go in and spray their crop and then immediately go plant and, and that can be kind of difficult as well. So, um, but those are the three biggies. If I can have the last slide, so basically 18 out of 20 of our growers are using some kind of cover crop, that is great. And if, if we can find that it pulls the water out of the soil and helps growers get on their fields, that will be a huge time saver for them and will be really important. And uh, lastly, uh, I think if we can get more of our growers adopting no-till, it'll be our best risk protection against this variable weather that we're seeing. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, John. Very interesting. The, um, the word cloud is interesting. I'm, I hope we have time to discuss that because I'd like to get back to that. But we're going to go to our last speaker. This is Hillary Sandler uh, with the University of Massachusetts. Um, she's going to talk about corn gluten meal for weed control in cranberry. And this is through several projects or funding sources, the Northeastern IPM Center, the Northeastern SARE, and an EIPM uh, grant. So Hillary, go ahead. Okay, um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Yep. So, um, you know, just very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this. Sounds like John just fell off there. Um, but we were interested in looking at uh, corn gluten meal for weed control, uh, primarily because we had certainly heard that in, in other situations that the corn gluten meal was able to inhibit the root formation and that seeds could either germinate and then die from desiccation. And in some cases, you know, the seedling may actually grow out of the root inhibition. Um, and so, you know, we, do, we thought that maybe cranberries being that, you know, we do have some good dry periods uh, that it might offer an opportunity. So if you're not familiar with corn gluten meal, it is a byproduct of wet milling the corn. It's a natural product that is approved for use in organic farming. And, you know, the biggest concern that we have is that it is a big source of nitrogen. The, as far as with the weed control, it can affect both monocots and dicots and was first pioneered for use in turf and now has been used in other crops such as onions and strawberries. 
And, you know, some of the uh, effects have been variable. So we just wanted to see what uh, might happen with us. So if we can go to the next slide. So in, in newly planted cranberry beds, uh, they can either be planted with unrooted cuttings that are scattered across the ground and then disked in, or people can use rooted cuttings, which uh, sometimes either plant by hand or use like a strawberry planter and go in at about one square foot spacing. So there's a lot of open area, at least initially, uh, before the vines get to colonize. So we definitely feel that weed control is very critical during establishment because they compete for that space. So we wanted to know, would it provide any pre-emergence weed control? So we go to the next slide. So we tried uh, several different treatments. We had what we called a low rate where we just did one application of 20 pounds per thousand square feet. Uh, we had another low where we did, where it was the 20 pounds followed by 10. We had a high rate, which was one application of 40 pounds, and then another high rate, which was the 40 pounds followed by the 10 pounds. And so this is certainly, you can go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, just in general, this is, an, an example of a, a study that presents results that you didn't necessarily expect. Um, here you can see on the very left hand side is the control that received no corn gluten meal and as we go to the right the uh, applications become higher and higher and the more we put out there the more weeds we got. So this was definitely not the impact that we were hoping to see. And, uh, you know, the addition of that uh, big slug of nitrogen actually supported a lot of weed growth. So it's possible that, you know, actually in these new plantings, maybe our cranberry environment was actually a little bit too wet and was not really the best possible situation for the corn gluten meal. But we did have a positive result with the next result, with the next slide, um, that we actually improved cranberry biomass. Uh, growth by adding the corn gluten meal. So um, again, if you can look at the graph going from left to right is the uh, the leftmost has no additional corn gluten meals, just a control or what the grower had done, which was basically no fertilizer. And then as we go to the right, we're putting on more corn gluten meal and we were able to get improved cranberry growth. So um, trying to establish plants in an org organic fashion with cranberry vines is very challenging and it may actually be that the corn gluten meal could offer a very nice alternative for, for growers that are trying to start their bogs um, in an organic fashion as compared to a lot of the growers who are doing organic, they actually transition a lot of their farms. So, uh, so again, it was uh, an unexpected result, but we were hoping for weed control, but we ended up getting a better colonization of the, of the cranberry vines. So I, that's, uh, I think, all about all I had. Okay, thank you, Hillary. Yeah. Uh, very interesting work. Um, I can talk to you a little bit, because I've done some work on corn, corn gluten meal, and it's, the results are similar to what we've found, what I've found, and oftentimes to control the weeds, uh, there needs to be a competitor there. So the lawn, that's why it works um, good in lawns because mm -hmm. the lawn is actually the competing source against the weeds. So when you give them that flush of nitrogen, it gives them, it gives it an advantage. Meanwhile, the weeds are su struggling to come up and then there's supposedly an inhibitory, you know, factor in the corn gluten meal. So it's a, it's a tricky one to work with and it's very interesting to see that and I could definitely share more with you if you're interested. Um, but uh, we are now in our break period for about another seven minutes and I see we've had some discussion online a little bit or our chat box uh, which is good. Um, I wanted to talk about the um, so, John, if you're if you're back on, I wanted to ask you this word cloud. Um, the the words that were um, you know the bigger the words, the smaller the words, was that related to like um, the data? So is that so the the worm the big the big um, worm was a big was really emphasized. Right. So is that directly correlated to a data set or yeah. is that just 
your general impression? No, that was directly, we, when you load in and you analyze the qualitative data, the more farmers mention their concern about a specific issue, the larger that word will be or be reflected in the word cloud. So, um, so worms came up over and over with our different growers when okay. they, so were you were just... they were, yeah, because we asked them specific questions about uh, what, what, what do you find is working best in no-till production for you and what are you most concerned about or what's, what's your biggest issue, what's your biggest concern moving forward with growing and a no-till system. And since the, the residue and the cover crops both are, provide habitat and, and protection for many insects like armyworms, um, um, that will come up as a, as a fairly large word in the, in the cloud. Uh, what you don't really, if you happen to have one grower that is totally concerned about army worms <laughs> or worms, that will, that will, that can skew the, the analysis somewhat. And we did have a couple of growers that um, army worms were particularly problematic for them anyway. Yeah. And so they tended to bring it up a bit more than others. Right. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting to me that, that, um, the, the, the things that were positive are, are consistently positive across the 20 growers we interviewed and many of the things that were problematic are less so. And that will be one of the real, um, uh, that will be one of the real take homes, I think. And, and it will be really interesting when we start these study circles to find out, um, it was interesting to us that we're going into the study circle tomorrow talking about weed management and starter nitrogen fertilizer as issues that we saw this year as being problematic um, for some of our growers. And none of those um, really rose um, to the scene as a real problem for, for some of our growers that we interviewed. Yeah, it's, it's almost like an informatic yeah, exactly. So it's kind of a cool thing. I yeah, that's I really like that. Um, I want is is Anna, if you're on, I had a question. Um, you know, the work that you're doing on the biocontrol is is that are those currently available, or is that something that is in research? You know, your research is still a research grade. Um, you mean the tifia parasitoids? Yeah. yeah. Oh, those are naturally occurring. So we found them, uh, we did surveys in Massachusetts and in Connecticut, and uh, they're pretty found in, in Rhode Island too and other Northeast states uh, as we go south from Connecticut. They were introduced uh, back in the 30s. So they're, they're all around. You do not need to purchase them. Uh, they're just naturally occurring. And the goal for our research was to find ways to promote or increase their presence in certain certain areas or at least increase their survival as okay. it has been shown that the provision of nectar is very important for them. Okay. Okay. Good. I was not clear, but that's, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. So uh, they're not, you don't have to purchase them. They're just out there. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, and then I guess Kirby, can you tell us if it's going to snow this winter? Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's going to snow. Some of the predictions are saying that we'll have a wetter winter, and I hope so, just for the sake of uh, this study. <laughs> we didn't have as much snow last year as I was hoping we would have. Uh, and we also need the precipitation just because the whole Northeast is in a real severe drought. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to move your study north of the border, maybe. <laughs> well, then we'll find out how the climate up there does. <laughs> okay. Um, good. Well, I think we've got about two minutes to spare. So, um, I, again, I would encourage folks, if you're online and I see a question from Sue to Anna, um, if you could make sure that you answer that question, uh, and then that would be great. So go ahead and do that. Keep using the chat box. Um, we've got about a minute for be the beginning of our next section, and we're actually, I'm going to start us a little, uh, one minute early.